in Scripture is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here today to enjoy a company together as believers in your son and believers in you. And we pray that your name will be honored and praised and our hearts will be open to the songs that we sing, to the lessons we learn in the lyrics, to the lesson we hear today from Phil when he continues uh, our, our journey through the book of Luke. Pray for your guidance. And we think of those who are not here today. Many of us have medical reasons for not being here. And those that are traveling and are on the road, and we know that uh, we won't see them for a while, but we just pray for their safety so that when they return, we can, they can be part of this fellowship with us and we can draw strength from them as well. And we pray this for your son's name. Amen. Amen. 590. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my hope. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me
so we know what's going on. She tore her rotator cuff, her labrum, and detached the bicep from the head of the humerus. Yeah, she doesn't do anything halfway. <laughs> all or nothing. She went all out on that one. So we're hoping that her appointment this week with the orthopedist will have a way forward for a resolution. Not that we want surgery, but it's probably the only light way to fix it. So please be praying for both um, Paula and Marie. Um, wow. A little bit chilly this morning. 
but it's December. It's supposed to be that it's December. It's January. Wake up. It's actually 2023. I think I wrote the check right this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Time passes very quickly, except when it feels like it doesn't. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us and this time that we've set aside to, to be together, to worship you, to sing songs of praise, to study your word, and to commune with you and your son. Father, we pray that you be with those who are not here with us this morning, that you heal those who are sick, that you comfort those who are grieving and dealing with <laughs> difficulties in their lives, and that you just help us all to be able to focus on you. Father, I ask that you be with me at this time, that I give this message that I've prepared. I just pray that, that your message will shine through in spite of my weakness. And Father, most of all, I thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. So you just noticed that the microphone was pointing at the top of my head. So you probably didn't hear much of that at all, because I'm a little bit shorter than some folks around here. Um, <clears throat> I remember back when our kids were little, we used to read to them. Well, okay, Marie would read to them most of the time, but I would read to them sometimes too. It was interesting to me when I would read to the kids. I'd start reading one of the books, and as I was reading along, what was actually written on the page, whoever I happened to be reading to at the time would reach up and just turn the page. The first time that happened, I didn't think much of it, but it kept happening. So I, I probably said something like, I'm not done with that page. And the response was usually something like, it's okay, I already know the story. <laughs> well then, then why am I reading this to you? If you know the story already, then, then why do I need to read it? Because <clears throat> I like to hear it. Okay, I guess that makes sense. I mean, I watch movies over and over again because I like the story, or sometimes just what happens in the movies. So that tracks for me. We all know the stories about Jesus, especially from the Gospel of Luke and from Matthew. So why are we taking the time to work our way through the Gospel of Luke? If we've already read and know what's there, why read it again? Sometimes with me, my, my memory of something isn't exactly what's there in the Bible. So it's good to have a refresher of what's actually there. And also sometimes we get a different look at what's there. So we learn some new facts or find some hidden nugget that we can use to maybe pique somebody else's interest in the story so that they'll want to know more about this Jesus person that we call the Son of God. So last week we read the first 25 verses of Luke chapter 1, where Luke writes about John's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now the last thing that Luke tells us about them is that once Elizabeth conceived, she kept herself hidden for five months. Now Luke changes to a new but related topic. Luke 1, 26 and 27. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now when, when Luke writes here in the sixth month, 
He's talking about the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, not the sixth month of the year. He's keeping the chronology going here by using John's conception as a start for his timeline. And now Luke introduces a new character to his narrative by following the angel Gabriel in what he's doing. Remember, Gabriel is Hebrew for warrior of God. This is the same angel that spoke to Zechariah and also the angel that explained the visions to Daniel. So Gabriel appears to a young unmarried girl. In the Jewish community, especially in the first century, being a young unmarried girl meant that you were a virgin. If you weren't, that was a stoning offense and was a black mark against your family. So Luke tells us this girl's name is Mary. Actually, in the Greek, it's Miriam. It's the same name as Moses' sister. So Mary lives in Nazareth, which is a small town in the northern area called Galilee. Um, really kind of in the middle of nowhere. And Mary is in, engaged or betrothed to a man whose name is Joseph. Now, betrothal is a legal process during this time. The man would come with a legal agreement with the girl's father, and he or his father would pay the girl's father to be able to marry his daughter because that family was losing a worker in their house and the man's family was gaining a worker in their house. But a betrothed couple was basically married, except they generally didn't live together until after the formal wedding. Let's keep reading. Verses 28 through 33. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, <coughs> and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary was troubled by Gabriel's greeting. I think for two reasons. First off, why would she, a humble girl from a small town in the middle of nowhere, be favored? And number two, why was an angel talking to her? I mean, really. She had to know at this point that there was something, some very special circumstances here. Gabriel continues with his typical greeting, don't be afraid, because that's always the first reaction to someone encountering an angel. But Gabriel tells Mary that God's favor was on her and that she would conceive and have a son. Just like with Zechariah, Gabriel tells Mary what the baby should be named. But Luke doesn't go into the meaning of the name that Gabriel tells Mary the way that Matthew does. In, Matthew, in Matthew's Gospel, Gabriel tells Joseph to name his son Jesus, quote, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua which means God is salvation. So then Gabriel tells Mary that God would enthrone Jesus on David's throne and that he would rule over the house of Jacob, that is Israel, forever. 
That's a big pill to swallow for a young girl. In the first century, Jewish girls usually married around the age of 14 or so, but eternal kingship was not the idea that concerned Mary at this point. Verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? 35 through 38. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who, has called, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. <clears throat> Mary questions the whole thing. How can I have a baby if I have never been with a man? She's not stupid. She probably grew up on a farm and knows how these things work. No contact, no baby, no problem. But Gabriel explained to her that this would be a miraculous event. God would cause her to become pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And as proof of this, Gabriel offers a bit of information that she doesn't know. Mary's relative, maybe an aunt or a great aunt, was Elizabeth. And even though it wasn't common knowledge, because she'd remained secluded ever since she became pregnant, Gabriel told Mary that Elizabeth was six months along with her own miraculous pregnancy and sums it up with, because nothing is impossible with God. So Mary, she concludes this encounter by agreeing to what Gabriel told her. <clears throat> Basically, she says, I trust you, and I believe you. Let God's will be done. Now, here's my question. Did Mary fully believe what she was told by Gabriel? I, and I would say, unlike Zechariah, Mary can still talk. <laughs> so I think she believed him, even if only just a little bit. Verses 39 and 40. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judea, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Was Mary curious about Elizabeth's pregnancy? Was she looking for proof of what Gabriel had told her? We don't know for sure why she went to the hill country of Judah to visit Elizabeth, but she did. She probably didn't travel alone because young girls during this time did not travel alone. From Nazareth to Jerusalem is about 65 miles. Zechariah and Elizabeth probably lived near to Jerusalem, within 20 or 30 miles or so. So it could have taken Mary a week, maybe longer, to get to the house of Zechariah. 41 and 42. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. There is Mary's proof that Gabriel spoke the truth to her. First, Elizabeth actually is pregnant. She's six months pregnant, it's probably visible, <clears throat> just the way that Mary was told. And then Elizabeth tells Mary that she is blessed and so is 
the fruit of her womb. In other words, Elizabeth confirms Mary's pregnancy, probably before she would have even known herself if it had been a normal pregnancy. Remember what Gabriel told Zechariah about their son. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. The unborn John recognized the unborn Jesus even before Jesus' mother may have even realized that she was pregnant. And he prophesied to and through Elizabeth about it. Now, Elizabeth wasn't blessing Mary and Jesus. She was simply stating that Mary was blessed by God and that Jesus was as well. But she recognized that fact because of the Holy Spirit. 43 through 45. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Here we see the difference between Zachariah's reaction to Gabriel's message about John and Mary's reaction to the message about Jesus. But we'll get to that. First, John's reaction to Mary's greeting when she actually arrived at Zachariah's house. Elizabeth said that the baby in her womb leaped for joy when she heard the greeting. We now know that Babies can actually hear what's going on around them when they're in the mother's womb. They have no context with which to understand what's going on, but they can hear it. And it may have an impact on their interactions with people after they're born. But John was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had context to understand what was going on around him. He heard Mary's greeting and through the Holy Spirit understood that Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, was there in his presence. And that made him leap for joy inside Elizabeth's womb. Elizabeth knew more than just that Mary was going to have a child. She knew that Mary's child was going to be more than just another child. She called Mary the mother of my Lord. She knew who Jesus would be and what he would accomplish. She knew he was more than just another baby. Now, before we move on to Mary's response to Elizabeth, I want to back up a bit. And look at what Luke is doing here with these two stories. Both of these stories, the story about Elizabeth and the story about Mary, are similar. The conception events were presented to participants by the same individual, the angel Gabriel. Both were told what to name the baby. And both were told that it would be a miraculous event. John's birth would be miraculous because Elizabeth was barren and was past the age where she would have been able to have children. John was a blessing to her, just like Samuel was a blessing to Hannah, although Hannah was not too old to have children. But Elkanah's other wife had been able to provide more children to him, which, which hurt her <coughs> deeply. Now, Elizabeth, probably felt similar to Hannah, and when she became pregnant with John, she felt blessed because she was no longer barren. Jesus' birth would be even more miraculous than John's because Jesus 
would be greater than John. As John points out himself during his encounter with Jesus during Jesus' baptism. The issue wasn't that Mary couldn't bear children, but that she had never been with a man. There was no scientific or physical way for Mary to become pregnant. It just couldn't happen, given all the details. But with God, all things are possible, just like Gabriel told her. If she doubted her pregnancy, it was proven to her by Elizabeth's reaction to her arrival because of John's reaction to her greeting. <clears throat> So now we have Mary's reaction to all these events. And in most Bibles, this has a header over it called the Magnificat. That's because in the Latin Bible, Mary's song here actually starts with Magnificat, Magnificat, my Latin is horrible by the way, Magnificat anime mia domino. Yeah, it's Latin. But it's the same words that we'll read here in a second in English. With illiteracy among the lower classes during the first, say, thousand years or 1,200 years of Christianity, <clears throat> and with Catholic worship being spoken in Latin, and Bibles being written primarily in Latin, people would know where the priest was reading from and would be able to recite along with them by rote by hearing some of the first words. And those sections became identified with the first few words. Like, for instance, the Lord's Prayer being called the Paternoster, which is the first, <clears throat> it's our Father in Latin. So here's Mary's response, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Now this is one of those times when people question what we read in the Bible. It seems that Mary's response is that she's bursting into song like some Broadway musical. That just doesn't happen, right? Moses did it. Miriam did it. Many of God's prophets prophesied in poetry. That's why most of the prophetic books of the Old Testament are written like poems, because they were. Here, Mary's response is her singing praises to God. Soul and spirit, the terms that she uses, they're different parts of our humanity. So basically, Mary is saying that her entire person, her whole being, praises God and rejoices in his blessing. That he would use her in her humility to complete his mission in redeeming humanity. God chose her. And remember, she said to Gabriel after he <laughs> told her what would happen, that she accepted God's role for her in all of this. She was in agreement that she would do what God had planned for her. God's mighty power voided the laws of nature and caused a girl who had never been with a man to be pregnant. There is no <clears throat> better description of Jesus in this situation than the Son of God. God caused him to come into existence. He could have created Jesus as a grown man, or to exist as some non-corporeal spirit, like the Gnostics believed in the late first century denying the humanity of Jesus. But it was important 
that Jesus was a man. That he lived his life as a human and faced temptations and yet still be sinless. God's mighty power caused that to happen. Mary didn't completely understand it at this point, but she was obedient to God and praised him for his power and his wisdom. 50 through 53. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away <clears throat> empty. Mary started by singing about the great things that God had done for her, even in her poverty. Now she moves on to the great and amazing things that God does for his people. These four verses here, they parallel what is said about God throughout the Old Testament. The word that is translated here in verse 50 as mercy is the same Greek word that's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for the Hebrew word hesed, which is usually translated, translated into English as steadfast love. <clears throat> God has always and consistently shown mercy and love to his people who show the utmost of respect and honor to him for who he is and what he does. God protects his people. And Mary sees his actions with her as a continuation of his protection of his people. Now remember, Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua, just like I said before, which means Yahweh is or brings salvation. That includes bringing down mighty rulers, exalting the humble, feeding the hungry, and humbling the rich. God is the great equalizer. But what I think is interesting and prophetic here is the way that this is written. In English, this is all written in the past tense. In other words, it's written as something that has been accomplished in the past. But in the Greek, it's written in what's called the aorist tense, which it's a version of past tense, but it's what they call unqualified. That is, there is no specific beginning or ending. It's something that happened in the past, but it hasn't stopped happening. These things that God does continue today and will continue until the end of time. 54 through 56. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. God's mercy, his steadfast love for his people is what caused him to help them. He remembered his people when they were in Egypt. After the sins of the residents of the land that he promised to Abraham's descendants had been completed, he kept all his promises to Abraham and to his descendants. He protected his people at least those who obeyed him, and kept his commandments, just like he said he would. Even when Babylon took Jerusalem, God protected a remnant of his people to continue the promise that he made to Abraham. And here, Mary sees the completion of God's promise to his people, sending his son to bring salvation, 
not just to his people, but to all people. Here at the end, Luke tells us that Mary stayed there about three months, living with Zachariah and Elizabeth. If you do the math, she got there when Elizabeth was six months pregnant. That has Mary there, possibly, about the time of John's birth. And that would explain how Luke found out all the details about Zechariah and Elizabeth. If Mary explained to him what had happened, because she was told by Zechariah and Elizabeth. That way, we all can know what happened. Why is it important to keep reading and hearing these familiar and popular parts of the Bible? So that they're fresh in our minds. So we are well rehearsed in what we know is there. And so that we can share it with people. Not just what we think is there, or what we think is important. But what we, what we know for a fact is there in God's word about him sending his son to live here as a human and to die for our sins. We need to try to have the same attitude as Mary did in deciding to obey God. We need to be willing to say, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, and mean it. Not just say it, but truly mean that we will do what God wants, and go where he sends us, even if it makes us uncomfortable. Especially if it makes us uncomfortable. We are here for God to use us to share his word, to make sure that his message gets out there to the people that he sends us to. We may not feel like he's sending us, but when we go somewhere, we're there for a reason. If you feel led to speak to someone about God, don't fight it. Don't quench the spirit. Follow the Spirit. Go where He leads you. If you have any questions about any of this, or if there's some way that we can help today, let me know. Let's stand together.
Jesus, keep me near the cross, bear a precious fountain, bring to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain, in the cross, in the cross, phrases that stuck in my head. I think when I was growing up with the story of Mary and Elizabeth, we studied, we didn't have the English standard, we had King James. And I think the phrase is, be it unto me as you say. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> English is a funny language sometimes. Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. <clears throat> he was de despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like the lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before shears is silent. So he opened up his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as far as, 
as far as his generation, who consider that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this bread that represents your son's body, which was nailed to the cross of Calvary. We ask that you would be with us as we take of this emblem, that we may have examined ourselves to be worthy to take of this emblem. Father, we ask that you bless us in Christ and we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this cup that represents your son's blood, which was spilled, not only on the cross, but as he was being tortured for our sake. Father, we ask that we may take this emblem in a worthy manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shut the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will find a way for me. The Lord has said, Father in heaven, we thank you for this state of giving to us. We thank you for this time that we have to take up this collection. Pray that we may use these funds in a way that is pleasing with you in accordance with your will. Give us and guide us in Christ and our prayer.
I don't know if anybody's been looking at long range weather forecasts, <coughs> but, um, well, first off, the weather's pretty nasty out in California right now. <coughs> They're getting, well, in the mountains, feet of snow. And um, the weather reports I've seen say it's headed this way Friday and Saturday. Keep that in mind. We may have to cancel some stuff this weekend, but we do have stuff planned for this weekend. This coming Saturday, we have a work day planned here at the building. Um, let me back up. Today, with no threat of snow, we will be at Gray Birch at 2 o'clock today, and then we will be at the Veterans Home at 3 o'clock today. Um, Wednesday, midweek Bible study at 3 o'clock in the afternoon here at the building. Um, Next Sunday, the 15th, we will have Sing and Snack here at the building at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, there will be a men's fellowship. We're going to start that back up on Saturday, January 21st, starting at 9.30. Um, we will have our annual corporate meeting on Sunday, January 22nd following worship. That should take about all of five minutes. Um, then you will have potluck after Bible study on that same day. And then following potluck, we will have our business meeting. So Sunday the 22nd is going to be a busy Sunday. Um, and then the following Sunday, Sunday the 29th, is a fifth Sunday. So we're, we will have freestyle worship on that day where, where we will share scripture and songs and um, have fellowship downstairs afterwards. Um, did I forget anything? David? Today's meeting postponed. We were going to have a meeting today after worship to discuss um, Marie's status with the church, financially assisting and setting things up so that she can get her Social Security credits in before it's too late. Uh, it's never too late, is it? But anyways, um, she's not here today to discuss this, so next week, hopefully. Anything else? Okay. Closing scripture is coming from the book of John, chapter 20, starting in verse 27. John 20, 27 through 29. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put your hand, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for gathering us today for this time that we have to be together, to study your word, to sing praises to you, to worship you, Father, to commune with you and your son and with one another. Father, we just thank you that we could be revived again today. Help us throughout the rest of this week to take this with us and to encourage others. Help us to do what's right, Father. Help us to forgive others the way that you forgive us. Give us everything that we need, Father. Protect us from harm and from the evil one. Guide us and use us as you need us. In Jesus' name. Thank you.